Probably the most common questions I get are in regards to the knees and shoulders. Whether it's questions about injury history, safety for exercise, or increasing athleticism, my mind always goes back to this principle. Specific adaptation to impose demand. The body as a whole and its parts will always specifically adapt to any demand that has been imposed upon it. I would also add the caveat that the adaptation is magnified the more consistently the demand is endured. What does all of this mean for the knees and shoulders? For the knee, we have the joint capsule and its connected parts, the ACL-PCL and the MCL-LCL, the meniscus, the articular cartilage, the various nerves around the area, and the various tendons. For the shoulder, we have the joint capsule and its various ligaments, the labrum of the shoulder, the articular cartilage, the various nerves, the rotator cuff, muscles and tendons. Okay, let's start with the knees because I think it's the simplest way to go about this. We're going to start with this research paper. So it's titled Effects of and Response to Mechanical Loading on the Knee. And the goal of this review was to lay out clearly how the knee responds to mechanical loading depending on the tissue. There's a specific amount of stress or strain that causes a specific cellular force to occur that causes a specific molecular response and the subsequent adaptation. In each structure, there's an underload, an optimal, and an overload stimulus, which has a direct effect on the tissue's long-term loading capacity. Depending on what you impose on the tissue, you can either have tissue failure, decrease tissue load capacity, have no change in load capacity, or increase tissue load capacity. And that's what we want. We want an increase in tissue loading capacity. So just like you'd program for any other training metric, say like overall body strength, endurance, or if you're a runner, different tempos or speed training, you can directly program for your own tissues internally, which will naturally improve everything else as you layer all other goals on top of this strong foundation. So let's get into it. And as a preview, keep in mind all of these tissues as investigated on the knee and the information learned thereof will directly apply to the shoulder as well. The first structure is ligament. What comes to mind for the knee is the ACL. An injury to this structure has been a career changer for many athletes. Oftentimes you see this injury occur when the foot collapses and your knee buckles inward. Put simply, more strain on your ACL occurs that it can prepare for. Now there are a multitude of different movement philosophies as to what is safe. Some even saying that the valgus position, it isn't even bad and we don't have to do anything about it. While others saying it is bad and we need to train our bodies out of it. I would fall in the middle ground here. Although there's probably benefit to be had by having access to the tissues above and the tissues below so that you don't remain locked in valgus. I also believe that based on what I'm about to tell you, body is immensely resilient. Good luck finding a perfect posture or body alignment. This world is broken, but doesn't exist, but you can absolutely build towards greater and greater resilience. So ligament, specific adaptation to imposed demand. In this case, the imposed demand that will lead to adaptation for the ACL is an increase in tension. What type of tension? Tension that is cyclic and below tissue failure. Cyclic literally just means occurring in cycles. Think of that as reps. And below tissue failure means that it's tension on the ACL that's not causing it to tear. To understand how to get the strain on the ACL, I included a visual from Aaron Swanson. He's a physical therapist who did a really nice article on the misconceptions around the deep squat. And in the process, he searched the literature to come up with the activation per EMG and various levels of knee flexion. As we can see here, the peak ACL forces will occur somewhere along the line of 15 to 30 degrees and still getting tension by virtue of the pull of the quadriceps all the way to 80 degrees. So what can you expect after putting ample tension on the ACL? Fibroblast cells will begin to activate leading to an increase in ACL mass, an increase in stiffness, which in this case refers to the ability to resist strain per a given force. It does not mean stiffness like we think of a stiff knee or stiff back. Also, it will lead to an increase in load to failure over time. Sure, you can overdo this. If you just had an ACL reconstruction, it's probably not best to jump into 50% body weight on a six inch box. What do I find to be the more common mindset? Avoidance. I had a history of knee issues or I'm currently dealing with a knee issue. So now I'm going to ice, rest, and take anti-inflammatories. Did you know that inflammation in this instance is a signal your body is trying to tell you that the area is not up to task with the demands of your life? Walking and bending down might not seem like a lot on the body, but again, if we consider that anterior tension is the force that can either make or break the ACL. You can understand how over time, if you're consistently giving your body rapid inputs of quick tension that the body does not have time to prepare for and adapt for, inflammation can develop, inflaming your nerves, leading to pain. And this balance of forces is involved in all other structures too. So that brings me to the tendon. The specific mechanical stimulus that was investigated in this study is an increase in tension from the muscle on the tendon. For things like tendinopathy, isometrics are often used to unsheathe stronger collagen cells so that you can start getting the weaker collagen cells loading to adapt. But from a tension standpoint, recent evidence on the Titan theory of muscle contraction has emerged, showing that in comparison to just an isometric contraction at a given length, 
when you instead actively stretch the muscle to that given length, a residual force enhancement occurs on the muscle, which would increase the tension on the tendon. What are the effects of this increase in tension? Tenocytes, which are tendon cells, will build more tendon cross-sectional area, increase tendon stiffness, which again, stiffness means ability to resist being strained, not tightness or restriction. Having larger and stiffer tendons is the exact recipe for increasing tendon elasticity, which is your ability to harness external forces into athletic activity. The foundation of the knee joint is the articular cartilage, and this is the cushioning that underlies the meniscus, both of them being inside the joint capsule. The force of compression that is cyclic and below tissue failure leads to chondrocytes. Those are cartilage cells to increase cartilage thickness, increase cartilage surface area, increase cartilage volume, and increase its ability to maintain integrity, resist deformation in response to that force of compression. On the flip side, if you avoid compression, which comes from full knee bend, will reap the negative benefits of decreases in cartilage thickness, increases in adhesions, fibrillations, fissures, and altered collagen synthesis. Prior dogmas like the one propagated by a Duke study in 1978 thought that because knees over toes is more force, that automatically means more danger. Nope, we know that there's an optimal stimulus for each and every single knee in the world. It may look different for different people, but the route is tried and true. Long-term, consistent stimulus is the route to go if you want more knee ability. Now for the meniscus. This structure also adapts from compression, but from what we know right now, its direct benefits are more so seen from a maintenance standpoint. It isn't to say it's not possible that research could come out that says it can hypertrophy or adapt. There just isn't clear literature right now that says it does. But there is some amazing adaptations in its environment, which I touched on in a prior video. But I'll just give the simplistics here. So with compression, cells within the meniscus will activate to prevent atrophy or shrinkage. And cells outside of the meniscus will adapt from this progression by pumping the meniscus evenly with hydration to ensure long-term protection from those forces. So a little different of an effect from the other structures, but the greater and more stable the articular cartilage foundation is, the more likely these meniscus water cells, for lack of a simpler word, will adapt to enhance protection to the meniscus from this compression. But the more shaky and damaged your articular cartilage foundation, the more likely your knee will swell because these cells will try to protect instead of enhance your knee's response to compression, the body is miraculously intelligent. The solution in either instance is that this full knee bend is needed to stimulate areas around the knee to become invigorated in response to compression. Finishing off the knee, the joint capsule is what encapsulates both the meniscus and the articular cartilage. Full knee bend gets that compressive effect for those structures, but for the joint capsule in particular, it also stretches and alleviates restriction of the capsule surrounding them. Why is that important? Think of it like a weight vest on your knees. If your joint capsule is immensely restricted, every single step and bend you put on your knees is only going to be magnified. This is just a demo, but if you have 50% joint capsule restriction, that's 50% more forces that a given force could be placing on your knee structures. If you only have 25% knee capsule restriction, that's 25% more forces. And if you have 0% restriction, that's a 100% decrease in forces if you started at 100% away from the norm. The more alleviation and joint capsule restriction, the more normal the tension will be on your ligaments, your tendons, and yes, cartilage of the knee. And this same principle applies to the shoulder. But that's enough of the science, now it's time to get into the application. How would I train the knees and shoulders to ensure not only structural balance of the muscles, but all of the intrinsic structures as well? First, perform short range exercises in the desired joint. For the knee, looking at short range extension. Short range just refers to the point of maximal tension in the movement. So with the reverse treadmill, as I'm extending the knee, tension is increasing. What I like to do is to go to failure so that I can prep adequately for joint range loading of the capsule and cartilage. Getting blood flow would be perfect for loosening up the joint capsule. You can use floss bands as needed. If even getting into this position with elevation is painful. After you finally open up that joint capsule, you can then begin loading joint range of the ACL and patellar tendon. Getting the tension out of the joint capsule makes it all the more likely that your work on the ligaments or the tendons will go smoother. Now we're gonna do the same exact progression with the shoulders. First, using short range exercises. Short refers to the point of maximal tension in the movement. When shoulder retractors are shortening, tension is increasing because of the band. This is going to increase mind-muscle connection and assist with blood flow to prep 
for joint range of the shoulder capsule and cartilage. What I found to be simplest here is to do a cross bench pullover on the ATG back bench. Simply sit on the bench to dissociate your pelvis from your shoulders. You can simply start with your arms as a regression, reach all the way back to full shoulder flexion, pause and reach across. Use dumbbell loading to progress. Once that joint capsule is open up, it's time to target the tendons. Now the shoulder is a bit different than the knee in terms of, it, of differentiating between tendons and ligaments. So the ligaments connecting the shoulder blade to the shoulder are truthfully tendons too. There are true ligaments that are passive structures that connect the shoulder blade to the head of the shoulder. The rotator cuff tendons also act as passive restraints similar to the ligaments of the knee. The difference is, is they also have a dynamic activation component. So how do we train these ligaments of the shoulder blade, these rotator cuff tendons? Most of the muscles of the rotator cuff are involved in external rotation. So if we apply the principle of full stretch to get greater activation of the muscle per the Titan theory, we need to get full internal rotation. What you're gonna do, grab a dumbbell, knee up on bench, elbow inside top portion of your knee, right on the VMO. You're going to maintain tall, upright posture, or fight the fall coming down. Posterior shoulder cuff muscles becoming actively stretched as I'm lowering down into internal rotation, which is aiding the residual force enhancement component of the concentric contraction, which will put more tension on the tendons, forcing them to adapt and get all those aforementioned benefits from before. <laughs> and put it all together with the full range ATG squat with chains. What this is going to do is strengthen the rest of your muscles through a full working range. Tension decreases as I lower down, and I have to lift up extra weight of the chains as I go up, which enhances that mind-muscle connection as well. So this makes for a functional application of the very specific intrinsic focus points of all those structures. Functional standpoint, just like we're using the squat with chains to increase that loading in the top position, same thing with the push-up. With the end goal of getting to shoulders, to fists, full pause at the bottom, elbows above torso, and explode coming up. To do the same thing functionally as the full range ATG squat with chains, which is activating all those stabilizing muscles all around to put in application all those very intrinsic, specific focus points of all those structures in the other exercises. So there you have it. Joint loading of the capsule and cartilage, joint loading of the ligaments and tendons, using short range exercises to warm up before either of these, and functional loading of the lower and upper extremity would be my go-to for prepping my tissue internally to handle the forces of life externally. If you have any questions about any of this, comment below. And if you'd like more information regarding the ATG Science Blueprint and how to get a discount, you can send me a DM on Instagram. I would love to tell you more. Recently, I came up with a full body program flow that's three sessions a week for three weeks continuously that is perfect for the busy adult or in-season athlete. I'd love to coach you through it. Thanks.